Let's test that we have a Yeah. You'll make an introduction? Yes. It's just a second. Hello, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. We are opening today's program in the 30th anniversary lectures of TFF on Peace by Peaceful Means. And I want to be sure that as many as possible of you can see this, and it can be done at dacast.com slash the video channel of TFF uh, that you have on the Facebook event also, and you can see it on facebook.com slash transnational. And so the last place, the latter mentioned place, is where you can also raise questions, comment on the lectures. Each of these lectures are 20 minutes and they begin on the full hour during the day. The first one now at 10 o'clock Swedish time. And we continue with the last lecture at 18 hours. So we have nine lectures today on various aspects on uh, <clears throat> piece by peaceful means, the Article 1 norm of the UN Charter, the principle that all governments, all our governments have signed. So, this much for an introduction. I hope that we have many, that you will share it with other people if you find it interesting. And I'm now happy to introduce today's first speaker, which is Dr. Gunnar Westberg, who is long-time friend and a TF, uh, T TFF board member and a person who has devoted his life to uh, nuclear abolition and he will focus today on Iran and the nuclear issues and so Gunnar would you come over? Thank, Thank you, you so much. Well good morning to you or what time of day there is in your place. Uh, maybe it's better to say Salam, peace be, we be with you on this day, whatever the time is. I am not Farhang Yahampur, who should be here to get, make his presentation. He knows Iran so extremely well. I have learned from him, but of course I am not the expert that he is. I'm sorry, Farhang, that you are not well and not able to be here. I will not give a general review, a general history of the Iran nuclear program. I will make some questions and try to ask them, to answer them as well as I can. The first one is a simple one. Does Iran have a nuclear weapon? I suppose all of you agree, no, Iran doesn't. However, I could rephrase the question, how is it possible that such a large number of people, maybe even a majority say, well, maybe they do, Iran has nuclear weapons. 
That is the influence of the media. Say the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Intelligence Estimate, the two leading intelligence organizations in the US, and Mossad in Israel. They say there is no nuclear weapon in Iran. And still, Fox News seems to carry more uh, credibility with some people. President Kennedy said, 1962, the great enemy of truth is often not the lie, the deliberate, contrived, and dishonest statement, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. We subject all facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations. We enjoy the comfort of the opinion without the discomfort of thought. Of course, you can never prove that something doesn't exist. Maybe John Irby has a nuclear bomb in his basement here. I cannot prove it isn't there. Maybe very well concealed. But it would be ridiculous to say that there is something, could be something, when it is obviously wrong. And it is difficult to understand the people can, against all good evidence, say there may be nuclear weapons in Iran. Now, that was a sideline. More difficult is the question, does Iran have, and has it had, a nuclear weapons program? If we go back to the time of the Shah in the 70s, um, Iran intended to build about 20 nuclear reactors with the help of the United States and also help of Israel and South Africa. As you know, South Africa was producing uranium, Israel produced nuclear weapons and they helped uh, the uh, Iranian Republic in the 70s. However, there is no good evidence to say that this help, this assistance, went into production of nuclear weapons. It probably didn't go quite that far. CIA said in 1974 that if the Shah is alive in the 1980s, and if other countries, particularly India, have proceeded with weapons development, we have no doubt that Iran will also follow suit and make nuclear weapons. Well, CIA was wrong that time. Iran had signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty as one of the first countries, and they obeyed the rules. CIA didn't much trust the international agreements, but this one worked. However, in 1979, after the Islamic uh, revolution or nuclear programs were interrupt interrupted. The attack from Iraq on Iran uh, changed the discussion. Iran thought that Iraq was developing nuclear weapons and probably they were. Um, so um, Israel certainly helped Iran even during the war against Iraq, which is often forgotten. But that did not include a nuclear option. So Iran turned to Pakistan, to Abu Qadir Khan, and he supplied, or helped so supply, uh, enrichment centrifuges. But his um, offer, which is reported to have been made to help with the production of nuclear weapons, was rejected, say the Iranians. Anyhow, something may have continued. Um, the CIA and Mossad say we have no evidence of a, of a nuclear weapons program today after 2003. But they say sometimes the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And it is possible, of course, that Iran has in some way resumed the activity in a nuclear weapons direction, which they had up to 2003. Um, in 2003, Iran offered um, to stop all nuclear activities and to take on an additional protocol from the IAEA. But um, President Bush, Bush replied with calling Iran a part of the axis of evil, and Iran withdrew and restarted the uranium enrichment program. And the sanctions followed to be worse, more and more severe. Um, 
It has always surprised me that Europe has taken part in these sanctions. Um, sometimes I would say even wholeheartedly. So I asked one of the more important persons in the European Union Parliament, who was very much involved, why does Europe take part in these sanctions? Um, uh, when there is so little reason uh, uh, to suspect that Iran is proceeding with nuclear weapons. Where well, the, the representative of the European Union said, well, you know, we follow orders from Washington. The representative was very blunt on this. There is no real support in our governments in Europe for sanctions, but we have to do as we're ordered to from Washington. So, uh, is, is there a nuclear weapons program in some respect in Iran today? An important person here is Ulla Heimanen from Finland, who was the IAEA inspector in Iran for a long time. And he maintains, and I've talked to him several times about this, he maintains these men who worked on the nuclear weapons program in Iran up to 2003, they certainly want to do it again. And I know them, I know them very well, I've been to their families, I have been drinking with them, says Ulla. And uh, he must be right, I, I think you can trust him, that there are those who once worked in the nuclear weapon program who would like to do it again. However, they had no chance. Remember, that's often forgotten, that all plutonium production is stopped and to resume plutonium production would immediately be recognized by the IAEA. They know where the reactors are. They have a little bit of nuclear enrichment going on, but to restart a nuclear weapons program, then Iran would have to buy 50,000 or more centrifuges, and that cannot be done uh, secretly. So if Iran would go back to a nuclear weapons program, and I'm fully convinced they don't have a real program today, if they want to go back, it will take them a lot, it will take them a considerable time, and it cannot be done secretly. When would this condition be that Iran restarts? One condition is if Saudi gets nuclear weapons, Iran will most likely too. So United States and the West should concentrate on stopping Saudi from acquiring nuclear weapons. What does Iran want on the international scene? That is a complicated question because of the political structure in Iran. We learn that the supreme leader, the religious leader, has the last word, and it does today. But remember, that up till 1979, the uh, priesthood, the Ayatollahs, did not mess into politics as has happened since then. That's a new thing in the history of Iran, where it was mostly Arab, or it was not known in, in the previous centuries. And there's strong opposition, even in, among the theologians, against this political work by uh, religious leaders. The real leaders of Iran in the past, and I believe in the future, are the businessmen. Business families have always been very important in Iran, so certainly these business families want to have trade. They want to have trade first of all, and they are very pleased that uh, the agreement now opens the possibilities for Iran to become a major trading partner to Europe and maybe the United States. Um, the leaders in Iran, the few I have met, really want, they know a lot about the United States. They want to have good relations with the United States and they want to send their sons to, to the universities in the United States, yes, maybe even their daughters. That's all of them. Um, Iran wants to take its place as the, um, the major player in the Middle East to be recognized as, as an important uh, um, factor, particularly in the peace efforts today. And I would say that it's very difficult to see that peace can be achieved without cooperation between Iran and the United States and Europe. 
Iran wants to get out of his humiliation. Um, and they are humiliated. In 1995, there was an agreement in the Non-Proliferation Treaty that there should be a nuclear weapon, uh, uh, zone free of weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East. In 2000, uh, European and American leaders promised this to, to Iran, but nothing is done. Um, that's very important for the future of uh, Iran's place in, uh, in the peaceful world. Um, I would, if I were to talk to Iranians, say that if they can do more, they should join the, com the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Um, they say, why should we do that when the US hasn't? Well, that's a very poor reason. Go ahead. Um, Iran did ask to be a member of the Central Asian Nuclear Weapon Reason when that was created. That was blocked by the US. I think Iran should make a new appeal to join um, if the United States blocks that. It shows, reflects badly on the will of the United States for peace in the area. Will the nuclear agreement that has been reached work? Maybe not. I hope it will, but there are uh, details that the devil has introduced into the, um, the requirements that Iran has to fill to uh, cooperate fully with the agreement. Uh, the additional protocol which must be signed uh, with the IAEA has many aspects and many details where the U.S. Senate can introduce problems which they can use as a pretext for breaking the agreement. However, the um, agreement is to great advantage of the United States and if the U.S. withdraws, Europe and China will get the benefit of the trade with Iran. I think the agreement will work. It's in everybody's interest. But can we in the future trust Iran? What are the political and military ambitions. I'd like to recall a meeting I had with the Israeli ambassador in Stockholm four years ago. I asked him, um, how do you see Iran? Oh, I, I don't like them. But they, they, are, they are rational leaders, you know. They are rational men. They always act in the interest of their country and of themselves. Yes, I said, that's good. So you think that they will attack Israel? Oh, never. Israel, an attack on Israel by Iran would be so disastrous. It would be a suicide for Iran. They know that. They will never attack. Um, but, said the ambassador, remember that if the nuclear program continues, even without any production of nuclear weapons, we must attack. We, so I asked time and again, will Israel attack Iran? Oh, yes if they continue their nuclear program. Why would that be so? Oh, said the ambassador, you know, the nuclear program will give such status for Iran in the area that they will be able to support uh, uh, terrorists even more than they do today. Terrorism, he said. There is very little terrorism against Israel today, four years ago. So, why would that be such a big problem? And Iran doesn't support anything except the Hezbollah. And Hezbollah is not very active now. Well, the ambassador, I think, saw that his arguments were very weak and started talking about other things. Um, but I suppose there we have the unsolved problem for, uh, there are many, but one unsolved problem in the Middle East, and that is what will the relationship be between Israel and Iran in the future? Will Israel and Netanyahu need to have the specter of the terrible Iran for domestic purposes? That could be a difficult problem that will also influence the US politics. But in summary, I think there are good reasons to believe that the present agreement will hold. There are good reasons to believe that Iran will return to its place of a major a uh, factor major nation in the Middle East, that trade will increase, that um, relationship between people in the area will be improved. 
And maybe if we look back at the Green Revolution in Iran, maybe we also have reasons to believe that uh, Iran in the future will be moving in a democratic direction. If the outside forces allow it. The Iranians remember 1956 when the democracy in Iran was crushed by Britain and the United, uh, and the United States. So, basically, I'm very optimistic that Iran will again be a peaceful and increasingly democratic country in the Middle East of great importance for the positive development of the area. And nuclear weapons, they will not um, produce if not if they are not provoked by nuclear weapons in other countries around. They have accepted the Israeli weapons for the time, but Saudi weapons would be um, a terrible threat to Iran's democratic development. As I said, I wish Farag would have been here. We would have learned much more from him. I just gave opinions. Thank you. Thank you very much for Shall I stay yeah, in the line? Yeah, stay okay. here for the rest of the okay. morning. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for this expose over the nuclear issue. I would like to ask you, <clears throat> you mentioned this decision taken long ago that the Middle East shall become a zone free of weapons of mass destruction. And uh, I would like to ask you what should be the next step now towards that. I mean, we can say that at the moment we have solved, it looks like, the problem of possibility for Iran to go nuclear has been stopped. Now, would the next thing be, for instance, to start negotiations with Israel so that it can um, disarm or abolish its nuclear weapons? Mind you, Israel and Iran has about the same military expenditures, and per capita, Israel is much more armed than Iran. So I'd like to hear, how do you see the next step if we have the positive, the optimistic, you know, attitude that you said you had to realize the dream of, of a Middle East without nuclear and other mass destructive weapons? If an agreement is made, uh, the agreement doesn't mean that the nuclear weapons will go away immediately. So Israel should realize that they should work on an agreement, one should come to a temporary uh, development of the agreement, this is what we would like to have. And had that been done, one could have induced parts of it, for instance the ban on chemical weapons, that would have been very helpful in Syria. Had that been done 10 years ago, Syria would have been free from, from, from chemical weapons today. That would have been a great thing. And then I could work on this uh, more and more, removing, uh, introducing nuclear weapon reserves, weapons of chemical, uh, and, and to re re remove the chemical weapons. Um, and finally come to an agreement while Israel still would have the nuclear weapons, but agree that on such and such a date, they would start to, to destroy them, and on such and such a date, they would be all gone. That would be possible for Israel, I think, to accept uh, in a few years' time when they see that the threats come not from Iran, maybe not at all from the area around, but comes from the division in Israel itself. Thank you. Thank you, Gunnar. I would uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I have a question also. I would like to ask you. Um, as long as uh, some one country has a nuclear weapon, like the USA, um, is it easy for uh, other country other countries to give up their uh, own nuclear weapons? Mm -hmm. As long as there's uh, still one uh, country holding uh, having nuclear weapons, <laughs> is it really easy for others to give up with theirs? Thank you. Well, it depends on, uh, some countries could, I say Britain could very well give up their nuclear weapons now. They are useless, they're just a decoration, it reminds them that they had an empire once upon a time. France also has the nuclear weapons just for status, and if they're guaranteed to be allowed to stay in the Security Council for another 25 years, maybe they can give up their nuclear weapons. It's a question of finding the right entry to the French mind. 
to tell them you will have a much higher esteem in the world without no therapist and with them. And if you don't see that, we will start to pour out your Bordeaux in the gutters again, as we did uh, 15 years ago. So they could, but Russia and the US, that is the problem. Russia is so inferior in military capacity that they will not give up their nuclear weapons before, uh, except when the United States also does. So the US must go, must leave its present uh, position. The United States says, and NATO says, as long as there are nuclear weapons in the world, we must retain a robust and reliable nuclear deterrent. Um, which is, of course, means we will be lost, the US and NATO. And then, of course, Russia will not give up. No, we need good and wise leaders who see that nuclear weapons are useless and they are a threat to the survival of mankind. So agreements must be made between Russia and the United States. And at this time, of course, there is no sign of that to happen. It could have been done in the 1990s. Could have been done when Gorbachev was there and when Reagan had turned around completely from using talking about nuclear weapons as something that could destroy the evil empire to say a nuclear war can never be won and shall never be allowed to happen and nuclear weapons will have to be removed. Um, it was possible, it may, it will be possible again, but today it's very difficult. Thank you. Thank you very much. No more questions? No more questions. No more questions at this moment? I'm very disappointed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. And we are back at 11 o'clock Central European Summertime with a lecture on integration, why and how the example of Afghan youth in Sweden that Christina Spenner has worked a lot with in the foundation. See you then.